I am Deb Catrati from CareFlight. Um, I'm the Educator and Quality Management Coordinator, and um, we're presenting shock and hypovolemia today. So lucky you guys. The first part is pathophysiology. We always have objectives. We don't need to go over those. But just um, because statistics are kind of cool, if you're me, um, the morbidity and mortality from shock, resulting from shock, is about 1.7 million adults are diagnosed with sepsis per year. And imagine all, not all of those walk out of the hospital neurologically intact or functional. So there's a huge, huge um, burden on society as a whole um, from a financial perspective, right? Same thing with TBIs, right? How many people live in um, nursing homes or care homes or secondary homes need constant physical therapy? Some of these people need the same thing. So there's about, there are about 270 deaths per year um, related, and this is adult only, non pediatric, okay? Um, related to um, sepsis. And one in three in hospital deaths are due to sepsis. Now, my bet is it's higher than that because we have a lot of hospital acquired infections, which now are going to be tracked, and hospitals will not be reimbursed or reimbursed based on whether the infection is thought to be hospital acquired. So I think things are going to start to get a little bit tighter with CMS. Um, compared to where we are right now. So, heads up. Okay, so physiology is always such a fun thing. So, what I don't want you to do is worry too much about the physiology. I'm going to, how much time do we have anyway? As much time as you want. They're, they're thinking 10, half hour, right? <laughs> yeah, 10, 10, 15. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, really, there are a lot of fancy definitions for shock. You know, if you look at the CDC, you look at the NIH, you look at the International Forum on, on Sepsis, everybody disagrees. How many people have heard about SIRS here? Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Okay, so SIRS was thought to be a separate entity. Now we just think it's part of sepsis. It, but then again, it depends upon what kind of side of the fence you sit on. One side of the fence says SIRS is a separate entity. Other side says no, it's just the progression of shock. So really the definition is that you don't get good tissue perfusion, whether you're not utilizing your oxygen um, that you have effectively or whether you have too, too much of a demand. The demand for oxygen is greater than what the, the body can um, utilize, okay? So what happens with that is very basically, you know, the cells are fed by what for energy? Glucose, right? And then there's ATP and all that stuff back here, right? So if you chew up your glucose in a, in a hypermetabolic state and you enter that hypermetabolic state, your body can't meet the demands when you're sick. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So I get really bored listening to myself up here and I talk all the time. Ask Marcus, if you know Marcus, our chief light nurse, he'll right. tell you that. Um, so interact, okay? Talk to me, tell me things that um, you have um, experienced because otherwise it gets really boring. So the physiologic process, we know, all know about oxygenation and ventilation, right? Yes? Okay. Yes. So <laughs> oxygenation is a good thing, right? Yes. So oxygenation, really what happens is oxygen just diffuses across the capillary membranes like your alveoli, right? And then we have oxygenated blood, right? We can breathe, the lungs are good, that kind of thing for oxygenation. And we perfuse the peripheral tissues and the organs. And I'm not going to stand too close because I'm going to go like this. Um, but if you don't oxygenate correctly, you have problems with hypoxia and hypoxemia. What's the difference between the two? One's in the blood and one's in the other Exactly. And that's caused by something called partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Don't worry about these fancy phrases. Um, I'll, I'll describe them and, and define them for you. So we know when someone's hypovolemic, do you get an accurate pulse ox reading? Do you get an accurate pulse ox reading if someone's shunted and they're peripherally clamped down? No. Um, do you get an ac accurate pulse ox reading when someone's cold? No. Right. So I will tell you this, all the men in the room, not you and I. Um, <laughs> For children, for little boys, when that happens, because pulse ox readings um, are so important to us, especially in pediatrics, we take the pulse ox and we take it around their penis. I know that sounds horrible, 
and it sounds painful, but it's not when, it, when you take it off. But it's the most vascularized organ, especially in pediatrics, okay? So something to think about, because you may think a child is crumping, and then they don't look so good, and then we change the pulse ox over, and we find they're doing okay. All right, something to think about. And if you go to a, a big pediatric center, you'll see that a lot. Um, ventilation is the, the active part, right, of oxygenation and ventilation. It's the actual physiologic process, and it changes what? What do you blow off when you breathe fast? Right, CO2. And air exchanges from the atmosphere, right, as we breathe in, into the lungs. So we hope at the same time we're oxygenating well, right, and that there's no mechanism or anything affecting the ability of the oxygen to cross the capillary membrane, the alveoli. So you want to look for chest rise and fall, BDM compliance. Does anybody know what I mean by that? Compliance. So if, if you're having a hard time actually even like getting air in, there's some problems in swelling. Yeah, swelling, or they may have something like interstitial lung disease, ILD, pulmonary fibrosis. Kids may have a primary lung or pulmonary problem. So. In um, pediatric transport, we typically use anesthesia bags. You know, when you go to the OR, you see the boggy bags, you know, that have a manometer on them because we can really feel lung compliance. Not so much with the bags that we use, the BDM bags, but you can sometimes feel that there's some stiff compliance, right? You guys have felt that? So something to think about because if you have really stiff compliance, you have to be careful not to cause barotrauma by really squeezing down on that bag hard. Thick principle, has anybody ever heard of that? Because I gotta tell you, physiology was not my thing in school. It means all is good, right? Thick, we're gonna have thick fun, everything is good, right? Everybody's doing everything they should, we have adequate glucose, we have good ventilation and oxygenation, the red cells are saturated, not hypersaturated, but saturated with enough oxygen on the um, red blood cell. And the oxygen is offloading like into the capillary membrane, the alveoli, so everybody's happy, everybody's good. Pulmonary VP perfusion, has anybody heard about that? That's okay, because it's also called VQ mismatch, which is a little weird, right? All it is is the ratio of um, oxygen that goes to the alveoli and uh, to the ratio of blood that flows to the alveoli per minute. So we want it to be the appropriate ratio. If it's not, then we have problems. That's all. So osmosis, this is the fun part. You can put your heads down now. It's okay. So what happens is you have like signs of early shock. Say it's hemorrhagic shock, right? So fluid goes from lesser to greater. So it flows outside of the cell, right? Crosses the membrane. So what happens when you start to cross the membrane like this in sepsis? Does the membrane stay intact, the cell membrane? No, it doesn't. And we get leaky, right? So what do you see when someone's leaky and you give them all this fluid and you go to see them the next day in the hospital, what do they look like? <laughs> yeah, it's called third spacing. Yeah, they look like puffed, puffed babies. Um, so the water crosses the cell membrane, the cell breaks down, and then you have apoptosis, which is cell death, right? Just easy. Water leaks out, you look like a puffy thing, and then the cells die. And I hit the wrong button. Oops, <laughs> okay. We're not going to talk about that. Sodium potassium pump. Um, this is kind of important because we want the cell to maintain a balance, right? We want enough potassium outside the cell, it's extracellular, and sodium, we want enough in the cell so everybody's happy. So when people aren't happy, what we have is cell death or, or shock, right? So ATP is the energy, right? Remember we talked, you know, there's ATP and all that in the background. So aerobic metabolism, is it good or bad? Anaerobic, aerobic. Aerobic. Yeah. Aerobic's what you want, that's right. It's a good thing. So when the body's doing what it should be doing, it breaks down carbohydrates, sugars, amino acids, and fats, right? So we have a nice, steady metabolic state. All's good. But we also have muscle contraction, we can breathe well, the blood volume that's circulating is an adequate volume. There's oxygen on it. We can digest food. We can eliminate waste. And the brain and the nervous system function just perfectly. 
So that's a happy state. This is an unhappy state, anaerobic me metabolism. So energy comes from the breakdown of carbohydrates um, and some other things as well. But if you don't have oxygen, adequate oxygen and ventilation, what happens is it starts to break down other things and proteins and amino acid, and you go into a catabolic state. So when you look at someone who's anorexic, are they catabolic? They're breaking muscle down, they're, so they're catabolic, right? So just think about good and bad. You don't have enough oxygen and, gly and glycogen um, to do the work. And what happens in sepsis? What do we talk about a lot? Lactic acid. So when you're septic, what happens? Yeah, your acidotic and your lactic acid goes up, right? So if we see a high, relatively high ac uh, lactic acid, we know the patient is septic. Sometimes there can be some other things that are confounding through that. But basically, they're septic. They're acidotic, OK, in this setting. So that's not good, because the higher the lactic acid goes, the higher the morbidity and mortality is in patients. And I caution you, one reading, one lab result of lactic acid does not dictate outcome, okay? We often use lactic acid now, we just say, oh my god, the last lactic acid is four. Holy shit, they're in trouble. Now we say, okay, it's four, we're treating them, let's look at the at lactic acid among other labs, and is that turning down or turning up? Is our treatment effective? Is it not effective? So we can do this for a while, but after a while, our body just can't do it. It gets tired. So we have, there are a lot of things that regulate what's going on with the body when they're septic. So forget negative feedback loop and all that, right? Because I can't remember all that. I'm just telling you right now. So what happens, the medulla, right here, in the vagus nerve, what happens if, if you decrease your arterial, arterial pressure, the, blood, the body wants to compensate and increase its blood pressure, right? Doesn't like to have low blood pressure. So the medulla, adrenal medulla, is right here in the superior aspect of the kidneys, okay? And really what it is, it's a hormone, okay? It regulates our body, what it breaks down, the work it does. And then it's immune response and blood pressure control. So blood pressure control is our big one right here, okay? So it controls fight versus flight, right? It releases epinephrine and norepinephrine. Remember fight per versus flight syndrome, okay? It also regulates, along with other, not, I, it, it, remember, a lot of these compensatory mechanisms, mechanisms do not function in isolation. They function together as we go through this, okay? Um, it regulates heart rate. Contractility, what does that mean? How well the heart works, yep. Yeah. Um, blood flow, glucose metabolism, there it is again. Glucose is just everywhere, okay? It's so important. And blood vessel tone. So in early sepsis, we see this compensatory mechanism where blood vessels kind of go, in the periphery, they kind of go, right? Like this, they're like, oh my God, I gotta shunt blood to the vital organs. The vital organs are heart. Right, right. So, but once it gets tired and the body can only compensate so long, the blood vessels vasodilate out, and what happens to your blood pressure? Exactly. So there's early and late sepsis. There, um, along with this, um, it also affects your um, vent ventilatory and respiratory responses because as they become acidotic, as you become more acidotic or not acidotic, and you're utilizing a lot of oxygen or you can't utilize it anymore, and you have cell death and apoptosis. So the body tries to increase its death and rate of regulation. So if you've seen someone who's septic initially, they're like, sometimes they can just be trying to take deep, a deep breath, but eventually they'll become verdictinic or, or <coughs> the respiratory rate in their throat. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system, oh, you know, better known as RAS. You guys have heard of this, right? Because I'm pretty sure they cover it in medic school. So somebody tell me about that while I take a sip of coffee. Farmer. <laughs> 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 Renin secreted from the lungs, which is, I'm going to take a shot of this, which is turned into angiotensin 1, which travels to your kidneys, and then turns into angiotensin 2, which has a direct effect on your blood pressure, which constricts your vessels. Yep, so Renin is actually in the kidneys, Renin, India, oh. Tennyson. He's a nerd, it's a good nerd. He's <laughs> <laughs> Right, so it 
regulates blood volume and cardiac output, which is so important. Kudos to you, despite your Audrey, pressure. you should have been on that one. Uh, I really did blood pressure stuff. So. <laughs> blood pressure. Yeah, it's pretty intelligent there, Audrey. <laughs> Okay, so the really important things to remember is that RAS um, regulates aldosterone, which is an exogenous hormone. What is this exogenous? <laughs> so, and potassium plays a role in the regulation of this. So you have a low blood pressure, renin is released, like you said, the angiotensin enzyme converts to angiotensin 1. See, I'm just you know, you guys, you, you young things need to listen, right? Because he was right. Just saying. And angi <laughs> angiotensin 1 circulates in the pulmonary system. ACE is released and angiotensin 2 occurs. Does anyone, do you remember ACE inhibitors? Mm -hmm. So think about ACE inhibitors in this. What do ACE inhibitors do? To prevent that conversion. Angiotensin 1 converting into angiotensin 2. But if you have an an ACE inhibitor, think of what it does. It prevents it inhibits ACE. ACE. Right, it inhibits <laughs> it. You're too stuck to have some. We'll get to Okay, so angiot angiotensin 2 stimulates the adrenal release of aldosterone. So what happens is your sodium level increases. There, it's re your body's reabsorbing water. So you have a theoretical increase in your circulating blood volume, okay? And your blood pressure should go up. So again, this is probably one of the most important ones for you to remember. So ADH is an endogenous neurohormone, meaning it's inside the body. What's our exogenous ADH? Okay, so vasopressin is a, I'm not good at this, can you tell? Okay. So exogenous um, vasopressin is a drug, and you may not be familiar with this drug. It's kind of a super duty drug that we use after epi or levofed, and we hang vasopressin because it really helps control blood pressure, especially in combination with the other drugs that we use. Okay. Math, do you guys know how math is calculated? You do now, right? So math equals <laughs> systolic blood pressure plus two times your diastolic blood pressure divided by three for adults, okay? This is an area of controversy. Ideally, when you're metabolically stable and not sick, your mean are trees and answers, okay? So your feedback regarding the pathophysiology is really important. Usually I use it for um, nursing students or grad students, so I try to break it down a little bit. So if it's too much, tell me so I can temper it for another presentation, okay? because your feedback is what makes it better. All right, who's heard of the trauma triad of death? So this is really something that we're using, especially in flight medicine um, with ASNA, the Air Surface Transport Nurses Association, and kind of is becoming an emerging theory of what we're doing wrong in the field, right? And sometimes right. So what happens is you have this triad, you come upon a patient who is either a trauma or who is septic, right? In this, in this case, it's sepsis, right? And what do we do? They have a low blood pressure, so what are we gonna do? Fluid. We're gonna give them fluids. So when we give them fluids, what's happening when we're giving them all these fluids? Cooling them down. Right, you're cooling them down. So what happens when you cool someone down not from a metabolic perspective? You're making them cold. Cool down their metabolic rate. Right, so they're becoming acidotic, right? Okay, and then we're like, whoa, so that's not good. So what happened, they become acidotic, and then we're like, oh, holy crap, we need more fluid, right? So we're giving them more fluid, and we're giving them more fluid. What is your protocol here for pressors? How much fluid do you give before you get start pressors? Like at the? I think 500 bolus. 500 typically, yeah. 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 Start, start. Right on reassess. Yeah. I like that, reassess. I think our protocol said you can give up to two liters for, I mean, you would consider pressure quicker if it's not working, but we right. can give up to two liters. Two liters. So here's the current thinking, especially in pediatrics. You don't want to give too much fluid, right? Because of all of this, right? So it doesn't have to be trauma. It can be sepsis or any other kind of shock, right? So we want to give warm fluid so you keep your fluids in warmer. 
Yeah. Okay. They're probably still a little colder than the internal temp of the body, right? Mm -hmm. So we're still making them a little cold, a little acidotic, they're getting more fluid, they're acidotic, now they're really acidotic, and then they're coagulopathic. What does that mean? Exactly. So really what we've done is created a potential situation for iatrogenic DIC, meaning iatrogenic glucosidic, DIC disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. What happens? You die. Yeah. <laughs> Much bad. Yeah. DIC is really, really bad. So it can be very, very difficult to reverse clinically. So this is my plug for what we do in the field really, really impacts how that patient does further down the line. I am, <clears throat> I am a true believer of what we do in the hospital needs to come out into the field, okay? You're advanced practice people, you really know your stuff. Who do we look to to bring patients to the hospital alive? It's all in here, right? Our first responders who are volunteers up through AEMTs, EMTs, and medics. Because without you guys, we wouldn't be in business, and that's pretty much how I feel. And when we're not being recorded, I'll plug one. <laughs> So we talked a little bit earlier, I mentioned compensated or early shock or uncompensated shock, which is late shock, doesn't matter what term we use, right? You know, early, late, compensated, uncompensated. SIRS, this whole idea of SIRS that we talked about, an end organ dysfunction, meaning multiple organ death or MOD. Compensated shock, we talked a little bit about this already, but your peripheral vascular resistance or your SVR goes up, right? It clamps down. So you shunt blood to the vital organs and then you have vasoconstriction, okay? So the potassium begins to shift, the cell wall becomes more fragile, it starts to leak a little bit, the body says, oh my God, what else do I need to do other than squeezing <coughs> down my blood vessels? So it attempts to increase its stroke volume by increasing its heart rate and hoping filling that, that in adults you have that left ventricular stretch so you get more blood into the left ventricle before it pushes out and contracts and put, pushes it out into systemic circulation. Side note, kids are different, okay? Kids, their left ventricle doesn't stretch, so they increase their heart rate or their cardiac output by increasing their heart rate. So you can imagine they'll last for a while and then what happens? The cardiac goes down and they crash. So peripheral vasoconstriction, adults, um, what happens, they all start to um, reabsorb water, peds, the same thing. They become mildly lactic, um, acid, mild lactic acidosis, and then it just continues unless we intervene. And your pulse pressure narrows, right? Like this, right? Your, your systolic and your diastolic. That's a sign of shock. So you're not using oxygenation. You're not oxygenating well because the cell can't do it. It's fragile, it's broken. So you don't get as much coronary blood flow. Your heart doesn't pump as well and you can have ischemia. So if you have someone who's septic and they're in septic shock, <coughs> could they be in cardiogenic shock too? Yes, okay, so that is a problem that we always need to remember. Shock, I don't care what kind it is, can also present with another type of shock, so multifactorial shock, okay? So always something you have to think about when you're treating someone for any kind of shock. So then the body gets tired. The blood vessels relax, the blood starts to pool, and you're in complete anabolic metabolism. And we talked about that, that's not good, right? Oops, okay. We talked about SIRS. What you want to look at here on this slide is some of those physical presentations that alert you to the fact that this patient is septic. So their temperature, high or low for adults? Usually high. Kids? High or low. Exactly. They can be hypothermic and that can be bad sepsis. Their skin can be mottled. Their heart rate can be elevated. It also can be low late in sepsis, right? and their white count is typically up, right? Okay. Sometimes you'll see a very depressed white count, but typically it's elevated. <coughs> you have end organ 
um, dysfunction and death. So the cell dies. Remember we said apoptosis is death. You get organ dysfunction. You become profoundly acidotic with an elevated lactate. Your cardiac output goes down. You have end organ failure, DIC, and death. Now, not everybody gets DIC, right? You said this, but many people do. Okay. So mod occurs when you get blood pressure that you can't control, that you can't improve because what happens is then there's hypoperfusion, you have tissue cell death, right? Um, you see more modeling, more acidosis, and then you have organ death. So what is this slide saying to you? When do we want to intervene? Way before this. Way before this. So clinical assessment is so important in this setting. Okay. What happens to your brain when you're septic initially? The blood is shunted to your brain, right? Okay. But what happens later? What do you see clinically? Right. Neural issues. Right. Kids may become more irritable, really fussy, inconsolable, and then kind of not much at all, right? So your body releases the epi and norepi, and then remember Raz. So from now on, you can call him Raz. Okay, that would be his new nickname. So um, you have an increase in ADI. He's going to kill me. He's never going to ask me back. Are you responsible for asking me? I hope not. So you have an increase. <laughs> the increase ADI. I think he's going to sit. I think he's going to sit. Not a chance. No. <laughs> oh, that's right. You're running the offices, don't you? With the brass. So your body increases its release of antidiuretic hormone and tries to prevent the body from getting rid of all that water. Water reabsorbs, sodium reabsorbs, and then you have the body. This is an interesting phenomenon. All right, Raz, settle down. <laughs> settle down. Settle down, Raz. So the spleen is kind of an interesting organ. So all of a sudden, the body's doing all this, and the spleen goes, wow, I can help out too. So it's going to discharge about 200 mLs of blood or a little less to help with that circulating blood volume. That's pretty cool, right? Your body has so many compensatory mechanisms. This is one of them. So have, have you ever seen this, like, the latest potato chip, chip ordeal? So, you know, grandma has good peripheral circulation. Let's Let's say grandma's got before she gets on the plane, right? She gets on the plane, she flies from Reno to Tahiti. And then while she's there, she's like chomped down on a bunch of potato chips, maybe, maybe not. And then what happens? The sodium, as she's sitting there, is diffused or passes through the membrane into the vascular space. So this is what Granny looks like when she arrives in Tahiti and she's not wearing her bikini, nothing like that, right? So the hydrostatic pressure drives fluid. Remember we talked a little bit about hydrostatic pressure drives fluid into the interstitial space. So that's space basin. That's what I look like when I get off the plane, because I'm grinning these days. So clinical presentation. So you can adults can lose 20 to 25 percent of their circulating blood volume before you see a decrease in their cardiac index or in blood pressure. Kids can lose about 35% of their relative circulating blood volume. And by the time that happens, you are way behind the eight ball, and they're very difficult to retrieve. Typically, they will. So your heart rate is up, it's beating along, it's not able to keep up with the body's needs and demands in that acidotic state, so your cardiac output starts to decline. You start to have a weaker pulse. They become dysmic, short of breath or breathing fast, they're restless. These are some of the things you see clinically. They can sweat or not sweat, right? They can be warm to touch or cool to touch, right? Either or, does everybody agree with that? Okay. And again, God, I get tired of this, don't you? So does your body, because it's not a good thing. They become hypotensive. Does anybody know what that word is, oh, here, yeah? No, 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 right. Because what your body is doing, the antidiuretic hormone, is causing your body to reabsorb sodium and water, right? Not let it go. Cool, clammy skin, you can have a really delayed capillary refill time. Where do you check capillary refill time on adults? Are 
usually do it on the kids. How about kids? Babies? Yeah, so you can go here. Um, I would go here. And then you can also go peripherally. Careful with neonates because they have acrocyanosis and you know, the bottom of their feet are purple anyway when they're newborn, so be careful of that for a few days. Um, so they're hypovolemic. They have decreased preload and afterload. We know that they can be in cardiogenic shock. This is a kid from Yale who was a multi-trauma, um, but sepsis initially, okay? Mom, long story, but um, this kid ended up dying. So we talk about different shocks here. We have distributed, distributed shock, which is sepsis. It can be neurogenic, and it can also be anaphylaxis, right? So you have profound vasodilatation peripherally. Obstructive shock, tell me a little bit about obstructive shock. What is it? Like what, when you're transporting a patient, when would you see obstructive shock? Yeah, and it's been, has anybody ever heard of saddle PE? So the yeah. saddle PE is like death, right? It just, yeah, exactly. So that's not good, that's obstructive, right? Um, an MI with right ventricular involvement, what is that, guys? What do you, every day you see IMIs, right? With some of them can have RV involvement, that can become obstructive as well, okay? We give them fluid, and then they have too much fluid, right? And then the hospital will be in the better and see them. But that's the way it looks, unfortunately. Mechanical um, comes under obstructive, and you would see that with tension pneumos and pericardial tamponade, right? Why tension pneumo? What happens? Right, so it's a question, you have a shift, right? Never forget mixed shock, we talked about that. You can have a motor vehicle accident, that's a multiple trauma, and they present with back pain, maybe a spinal injury, they're not moving bilateral lower extremities, they may have bruising over the anterior abdomen, hypotensive and tachycardic. What types of shock would you think about here? Neurogenic. Yeah. And? Yep, why neurogenic? Can't move. Back pain, yep, decreased mobility or um, response. And bruising over that anterior abdomen is so indicative of bleeding, right? Also retroperitoneal bleeding, you typically may not see the bruising um, initially, but you can see it soon after the presentation. And they can dump like two liters into the retroperitoneal space. So again, they become hypotensive, tachycardic, so low volume state is hypovolemic shock. We don't have too much more to go in there, guys. Okay, so you have traumatic shock, non-traumatic shock. You have burns, excessive urination with SIADH, which is something we see in the hospital and typically don't see in the field, and insensible losses. So hypovolemic shock can occur with a trauma incident, a trauma patient with a non-traumatic patient who has like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. We see that a lot in elderly people and kids, right? That's more eating, especially postpartum. Lucky that. BC-10 is going to... You guys can stay out of the way. Um, so you can see hypovolemic shock with trauma, non-trauma. Do you see hypovolemic shock with burns? You do. Yes. Why is that? Yeah, they can't maintain their fluid adequately. Right, because the cell walls are destroyed and everything yeah. just leaks out. So on that note of interest is that we tend to flood people way too much. Fluid. And that complicates matters down the line. They get more third spacing, their skin splits, they get um, sep become septic from skin infections, grafts don't take. So that's why I said things that we do out in the field and in the ED are really in, in, are indicative of how they will do further down the line, whether it's burns or something else. So you get all this third spacing, which is hypovolemic as well, a low volume state, nucleotitis, <coughs> peritonitis, and bowel obstructions. Okay. So what are we gonna do? How do you treat these people? What do your protocols say? Tell me what your protocols say. 
So we, we want to start to shift, and we, we're really working on this in the pediatric world and in the adult world, um, is that we want to start to think about pressors not in hypovolemic shock, because if you don't have enough in the pump, in the, you're not going to serve any good, right, if you give vasopressors, right? If you give epi and they're just a trauma, I don't mean just a trauma, but they're a trauma with a low flow state, are you going to do anything? Do we give pressors in, in trauma? No. So we give crystalloid fluids. Does anybody know what are crystalloids? What are the two crystalloid so pressures? Should be about 60 to 65. We talk in head injuries that we want it to be higher, right? There's controversy about that now that perhaps we're keeping too high of a map with um, closed head injuries and, and that kind of uh, event like the TBI, the weed, anything like that. Because what happens is you're probably causing more swelling. So that's the current thought. So we may see in the literature that that's going to come down. We don't want to be 85 to 90 for a map. We want to be a little bit lower. Okay. Tissue perfusion. Let's talk about this because this is really kind of important because this is something that we assess clinically in our head. Everybody does, right? Every single patient? Mm -hmm. Okay. So your blood pressure is really your cardiac output times your systemic vascular resistance. Does anybody know what SBR is? Think about that. We were talking about blood vessel tone. So systemic vascular resistance is kind of uh, the pressure that your heart pumps against in your peripheral blood vessels. Does that make sense? So if your peripheral blood vessels are squished down like this, do you think your SVR is high or low? High. high. And if it vasodilates out? Low. It's low, right? Early shock, late shock. Um, stroke volume is aff affected by preload, which is really your end diastolic volume, how much blood is in your left ventricle at that last moment before it squeezes, okay, or contracts. If you have, have, have any of you ever seen a patient with an enlarged liver, like in cirrhosis? So that causes um, portal hypertension and right heart failure. So that's another area, another time that you might see uh, increased preload. Afterload is your systemic vascular resistance. It's the resistance that's required to open up that aortic valve, to cross that aortic valve. And uh, SVR is driven by 80 times MAP, right? Minus your CDP divided by your cardiac output. Oh my God, what does that mean, right? What does that mean? Think about it. It talks to what your, your systemic vascular resistance is, that blood vessel tone, right? So that's one thing we're talking about. How thick is that blood? You know, the blood viscosity. Do we have problems with the blood? Is there a good blood volume, a bad blood volume? And also the length of the vessel. So that's kind of getting into advanced physiology, so don't worry about it, but just something to think about. So blood vessel tone, blood, and vessel length. Okay. Blood pressure control, again, the body never does anything simply. It wants to do, some, do one thing with everybody else involved, right? So this is just another mechanism. So we talked a little bit about if you have a low arterial, arterial pressure. I can't talk this morning. I think it's because I haven't had my coffee. Um, you increase your blood pressure. So here we go again about adequate tissue perfusion. Systolic blood pressure, we want to see 80 to 90, but that is pretty equivalent to a map of 60 to 65. So that's a takeaway there. So we talk about shock. So we already know the membrane is fragile, right? The cell membrane that breaks down and you get that third spacing, that interstitial fluid, and you look kind of like the Michelin man. Um, we know that, oy, we talk about pH dysregulation. What does that mean? Are you acidotic or alkalotic? Exactly, exactly. So you become metabolically acidotic. And then there's this whole thing with something called a cytokine storm, which is studied not only in sepsis, but also like in type 1 diabetes and other disease entities. So what happens is everything starts to 
become inflamed, so anti-inflammatory, right? So th this system, this starts to occur, and then you do not have good blood flow to wherever, your periphery and your vital organs, and then again, a serum lactate elevation. So this is another way to look at it, and you're probably all sitting here going, oh, okay, right? And yeah, it's okay. This is just a simple chart that shows you what happens in kind of different kinds of shock. So in hypovolemic shock, let's look at cardiac output, right? So you have pretty good cardiac output initially, but then later on it drops, right? So your systemic vascular resistance, you are compensating for a while, you're not going along, vasoconstricted, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be, do antidiuretic hormone is kicked in, everything's going along, and all of a sudden, boom, you lose your blood pressure. Cardiogenic shock, I can do this right, same thing. Distributive shock or sepsis, you can have an elevated cardiac output or a low cardiac output. It depends upon how severe it is. This also applies to neurogenic shock. So your systemic vascular resistance can actually compensate a little bit and then it drops. All right, nonstop shake. Everybody's happy, we already talked about this, everything's good. In physiologic shock, again, here we go, we talked about, and I'm driving this point home because it's what you need to kind of remember personally so when you assess someone, you know what you're assessing and why, okay? What's happening to the body. So you don't have a good circulating blood volume, your metabolic, aerobic to metabolic me metabolism, that wasn't right, sorry about that. Um, so blood, oxygenated blood is going across the capillary membrane, blood is being shunted to the vital organs, your cardiac output stop, starts to drop, as well as your stroke volume. If your stroke volume drops, it means your preload and afterload have dropped as well. And this simply means you vasodilate out capitans. Okay, so we already talked about that. You don't need to see it in this form. My son called me with that slide. Can you tell? So how do you feel right now? Kind of like, oh my God, I've had enough of this. That's pretty much, I get that. Okay. So now we're going to do something else. Do you guys want to take a five minute break? Sure. Yeah, this will be more fun. Or as my kids would say, we were really funny. Any questions at all? That's just really brief. Oh, okay. The words you probably used. Normal CLR. Normal CLR. NLR. Yep, exactly. We like to give blood in the field um, with MTP, massive transfusion protocols. And this is something that um, I'm looking at with CareFlight. We, I want to start to carry blood. Um, most transport programs do. However, CareFlight is not an academic-based program, meaning it's not attached to a hospital, so it's a little more difficult and labor-intensive to do this. But we know from studies that if we give so much crystalloid fluid, if it's a trauma, and then we give TXA without giving too much fluid, and we give blood, whether it's uncross-matched red cells or whole blood, we know from the literature that outcome is better, okay? We have improved outcomes. I hope in years to come, we will be able to do more of that, like with fire department response teams. Um, we, often take them to radiology to find out what's going on and also surgical intervention after we evaluate them. And these typically are not, if they're really sick, they're not a long, prolonged intervention, hopefully. And this is a case in point, a PD child that um, was four years old um, when I was at Yale just before I left was sitting in the front seat, passenger seat, on supposedly dad's lap who ended up handcuffed and dragged out of the trauma room because he wasn't the dad, but anyway, he said he was. The little boy was sitting on his lap, and he had the lap belt over the baby, the four-year-old, and the shoulder belt over himself, across himself. And there was a high-speed chase, the car was stolen, they had a metal light pole, those big metal light poles. So think about that. Think about, it's not just that child's weight and velocity, it's the father's weight, or ostensibly the father's weight, behind him and velocity. So imagine that injury to all those intra-abdominal intra organs, right, and his lungs, potentially. So EMS did a really good job. They called us, they were like, I don't know, 
maybe eight minutes out, nine minutes out, and they said, the child seems okay, um, he has some seatbelt bruising, this was the mechanism of injury. And as soon as we heard mechanism of injury, we were like, oh boy. By now, they're about four minutes out. They did a good job. They knew that they had to get the child to the ED. We would prefer they got kids to the ED quicker. We were a level one trauma center for teens and adults. And then they called and said, he seems really sleepy. And then we're like, uh-oh. As soon as we heard that, we called for a massive transfusion protocol, an MTP. And then when they got him into the ED, he basically became unresponsive. So we put, just drilled him. You know, that's the other thing with peds. Don't waste time trying to get peripheral lines. And I'm really good at it. I've done it for 19 years. And even I can't get him in when they're that sick, okay, and that hypovolemic. The kid and um, then stayed, we took the kid off the structure into the trauma room stretcher, or onto the trauma room stretcher, and then we went to CT. And then we went back to the ED, and then we decided we would go to IR, and the radiologist, this is just because our CT and IR are right here by the ED, so it was just a matter of minutes. They call and said, oh, holy crap. He, is, he has a massive liver left, and he's bleeding massively into his um, cavity. So what happened is the apex of his heart, which is down here, had rotated up. So that's how much he bled. We took him to the OR. He could before he went to the OR. Opened him up, and he bled out. So, yeah, it was really bad. So we, we didn't do the right thing. So we did a, a case presentation and morbidity and mortality rounds on this kid. Very contentious. It's unfortunate when these kind of case presentations become that contentious. And the reason I say this is you guys should be doing this with certain cases and you probably do case reviews. Um, but we didn't do the right thing. We should have taken this kid right from the EMS stretcher right to the OR. Would that have changed his outcome? Probably not, because he had a grade five liver lack and it was just shattered. But for the future, we learned that our process needs to be different. And we're a big level one trauma center in the country, Yale is. So we didn't do it right. So we had to go back and look at our practice, figure out why we didn't do it right and how to correct it. So that's never a bad thing, it's never a negative thing. So if you do case reviews, don't ever feel like you're being pigeonholed when you are asked to do a case review. We have a case review coming up on a pediatric patient that we're gonna do in October. And I know people are feeling a little uneasy about it, but our team did a great job. Unfortunately, the kid died. Um, people died, right? So they're going to do a PowerPoint presentation on the child, what they found clinically, what they did clinically, and what, his, um, what happened before and after at the hospitals that he was involved in. And we're gonna talk about it. They're also gonna do a PowerPoint presentation on that disease entity which was found on post. Um, and Dr. Gonda, if you guys know Dr. Gonda, he's our medical director, he's the critical care medical director at Renown. Very bright man, I wish we had him right now. He's so good. Um, is going to facilitate that along with myself. And it's a learning process. So do do them. Pick out what populations you want to do case reviews on, and it's a great learning experience because I can tell you, even if you didn't do something quote unquote correctly, I'll bet 95% of the people in that room have done the same thing, right? So it's a good way for all of us to learn. So that's my plug. I promise I won't do that again. Where did I put mine? Okay. So, There's a primary assessment and a secondary assessment in shock, right? It doesn't have to be traumatic, right? It's a primary and a secondary. And I think you said if you provide an intervention, you have to reassess, right? And that has to be documented in your documentation, okay? Don't just reassess and not write anything down. You have to have it there, right? Secondary surveys are generally not done on scene. Do you agree with that for the most part? Sometimes you do them in the back of the rig just to make sure there's no obvious hemorrhaging or some other injury that we've missed that's of significance, but we don't really do them. So threat assessment. Primary assessment and a rapid trauma assessment is scene safety always. We tend to forget about that, especially with kids. I can't tell you over the years how many times, including myself, did not assess scene safety because it was a kid. Um, it becomes emotional. Everybody's revved up. Make sure you're safe. And we say that so often today, but we still have to say it. Make sure you're safe, because you guys are so important. 
for the patients that are coming down the line and for your families and yourself mostly, or firstly, I should say. Circulation, so we tend to do circulation, why? Because we're looking for hemorrhage, right? Because if they're hemorrhaging, you can do all you want, but it's going to be for naught. Airway, breathing, circulation's up here. What else do you do with circulation? While well, you're checking, someone's gonna be, if it's a trauma, putting a collar on, right? Yep, or if it's an electrical burn, it's trauma until proven otherwise, okay? If the patient is, doesn't have good recall. Airway, breathing, neuro, just doesn't have to be this in-depth neuro evaluation. If it's a stroke, then you're on a different pathway, of course. Um, and expose and thermoregulation. We think of thermoregulation with kids, it's just as important in adults, especially burns. If you're not sweating to death in the back of that ambulance, then that child or that adult isn't warm enough and burn, okay? Hemorrhage control, we talked about that, C-spine. Always, always look at the mechanism of what their illness is because it may not fit the story. You can have shock with overdoses, right? You can have cardiac, cardiogenic shock. We had a calcium um, channel o overdose who um, took an extended release calcium channel blocker. The only reason we knew was because she denied it, of course. She was like 16, denied it, denied it, denied it. Um, was a little bradycardic and then was fine. But when we got her to the PICU, all of a sudden she was talking to the physician, the intensivist seized and coded. So the only reason we knew at that point in time, EMS called us and said, I want you to know that one of the teams saw an open bottle of meds on the table and then went and looked at it and it's a calcium channel blocker. That is a highly dangerous overdose because um, it affects your heart, right? So calcium channel blocker blocks calcium. So this kid, so the ability for the heart to pump, right, to contract. So what happened is this kid ended up, um, we had six peripheral lines in, drilled her as well because we had insulin drip, a fat emulsion, a bicarb drip, drip, vasopressin epi, levofed, isuprel, um, there was something else, and then she went into heart block, so we had a fluid wire. So this kid got way too much fluid. So another, you know, we all forget about fluid sometimes when things are going on. She ended up getting 10 liters of fluid and went into AKI, acute kidney injury. So, should never happen, but I'll bet there's somebody in this room, including myself, where I've opened up fluids and gotten so focused on what else I'm doing that I haven't gone back and checked that fluid. I mean, that's kind of happens pretty frequently. So that's a stopgap that we need to remember. We didn't help her, thank God we were lucky that her kidneys opened up and she, we were able to diurese her, but it was way too much fluid. We did everything else right, but we, we goofed on that. More than goofed. Airway, supplemental oxygen. What does your protocol say? You want to keep us out of what? 94. Yeah, ours is 94. Yeah. Um, you want to protect the airway, suction. Airway adjuncts, adjuncts, we often forget about NPAs and OPAs, right? I'm having my morning hot flash. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I apologize. Um, so we forget about that, especially in kids. An OPA, I don't like quiet kids. I like pissed off kids, right? Everybody in this room agrees, unless you're home. <laughs> and everybody likes a pissed off kid. <laughs> but if you put an MPA in and it arouses them and it opens up their posterior pharynx enough to piss them off, then I'm like, yeah, that hurts, okay, we're good. So now I don't have to go to plan B, which was probably intubation, right, with this kid. You want a suction, uh, especially, I'm gonna talk about adults and kids. Older people can get really bad respiratory infections and get a lot of schlitz. I don't know if you're allowed to use a bulb syringe. You probably are, right? Suction. So, especially with kids, you can take one of those, um, I think yours are pink, um, normal saline bullets. You can put the whole thing down, even an infant or a half of it, and then you just depress the bulb syringe. And don't be dainty. Just really shove it up their nose and let it expand, and you'd be surprised. It can clear their airway. They'll gag, they'll cough, they'll spew, and they'll think, oh my God, my God. But once you get that thick, tenacious schmutz out, they can breathe. The other thing with kids is, is um, I'm, I'm, I'm grass again. Sit up. Okay, 
Drop your chin just a little bit. Okay, a little bit more. Okay. So with kids, they can have an occluded airway and or just kind of like gurgling breaths. If you just go like this and put them in a neutral position, that can often be enough to open up their airway and give them some supplemental oxygen. Thank you. Good shave job this morning. You never gonna ask you that. That's where the bottom chin work up. Yeah. You're a star student. Star student. No, I think that's Raz, right? No. I'm not sure that's Sar. Or maybe it is backwards. Sar. That's not good either. Okay. So you want to look for chest excursion. Chest rise and fall. Is it equal? Is it not equal? Um, is it adequate? Is their respiratory rate fast or slow? Are they breathing regularly or not? This can be with trauma, shock, DKA, which is a form of shock, right? Okay. And you want to keep their SpO2 for you guys above 94%. You may have a ventilation issue or an oxygenation issue. It depends upon what's going on or both. And beeping out is very underutilized. Do you agree with that? Okay. So um, I attended a um, seminar in New York City with um, Cornell Wheel, Wild Wheel Institute, and it's called Penn Base Camp, Pediatric Emergency Medicine. It's nothing but three days of high death sims, complex sims from early seven in the morning till seven at night. And then one day is five hours of cadaver, cadaver lab where you have 15 cadavers lined up and you use every airway adjunct, every um, visual aid that's out there and you do intubation, surgical crikes, needle crikes, chest tubes, simple thoracotomies, and crack the chest. It is an incredible experience. The one thing when we got there the first day, they're like, okay, you're going to go here and you're going to do CPR and you're going to go over there and you're going to bat and you're going to switch and we're all like, oh, really? Because we're all pediatric clinicians. Come on, get over it. We suck at CPR. We really do. And we are even worse with BBMs. So it is a basic skill, and they have this study has been over a course of five years, and it really speaks to our practice, right? So I think I'm pretty good, right? Been in business for 30, 31 years. I'm like, no problem, I got this rocked out. And the BDM was terrible. So the big thing is people tend to not size the mask correctly, all right, for PD and adult, because we did both. They tend to press down too hard for pediatrics, and if the mask isn't sitting appropriately, it can cause orbital pressure, which causes vasovagal response, right? Or when we're bagging a kid, we're taking our hands and we're doing this. So your C clamp should just be right here on the bony part, right? Not in the soft tissue part. So those are a lot of the issues. The big issue we found is we're all nosy, right? So you're with your partner. The, the adult or the kid is really sick and you're bagging them, you're bagging them, and then so we're either bagging too fast, we just had a patient that we transported with an end tidal CO2 of 11 because people were bagging too fast and it was a respiratory therapist, someone who's trained, mm -hmm. right, because we get nosy and we forget what we're doing and then there's this phenomenon called drift. So I'm bagging and you're packing that spurting arterial bleed and I'm putting a tourniquet on and I'm like, oh, what's going on? Just that little shift causes a break in the seal when you're bagging. So whoever is doing airway, don't be nosy. That's all you should be doing, okay? I know that's hard in the field when you only have two of you two. That said, just kind of keep it in mind. This is what I do at home, too. I can't remember where I put things. Okay, capnography, we'd like to see at 35 to 45. Um, we can have a class on waveforms if you want at some point um, with end tidal CO2 and what the different waveforms mean. Um, you want to, if you're hypoventilating them or they're not ventilating well, that's a real problem. Um, acidosis, be very careful in the closed head injury. That kind of neurogenic shock or even if this is um, a mixed shock, why is that with, with ventilating them? Why do you want to be careful? Right, so we used to say, oh, we're going to blow off that CO2, and we would just drop, and we'd bat them down to like 25, and we'd be like, yeah, we're good. But then there's this thing called reverse steel phenomena, which we don't talk about much anymore because you guys are young and we don't do it anymore, but I'm old, so I'm going to talk about it. So what happens is 
where you've blown off that CO2 and they're, they have vasoconstriction of their cerebral blood vessels, right? You all of a sudden have oxygen in them and they go boing. So you have a rebound increase in this EP. So make sure you maintain it per your protocol. What's your protocol here for antidotal CO2? For the head injury. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have a separate. Good what? Four for a closed head injury? We don't really have increased no, 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 protocol no. defining for a closed head injury. So that's something you might, you guys follow county protocols, right? You're wrong. That's something you might want to address because we know we should keep them right around 2830. Okay? And if you want to address that, I can send you the literature on it so you have supportive evidence for it. And that goes for anything. If you run into a case that you um, want to know more about and you can't access that, those journals or something, just let me know. Um, so do you intubate them or not? That's always a question. The, this is the waveform we can talk about in another class. Um, so circulation is an indicator of shock, right? Either it's hypovolemic or they're not perfusing, they're clamped down for whatever the cause of the shock is. You want to pay attention to their pulse. Is it weak? Is it strong? Is it thready? Is it fast? Is it slow? Um, you want to look for that narrowing pulse pressure, right? We talked about. You want to look at their skin. You Really important because after you get a couple boluses of fluid, can you ever see an improvement in their skin? Do you see an improvement in catheter refill? Yeah. So it's really important to look at. Kids can have a lacy kind of appearance if they're um, modeled and it can be normal for like little kids, like a two-year-old or three-year-old. So you have to ask the parent or the primary caregiver. If you've never seen it before, you might think it's modeling. It's not. It's just a normal lacy appearance, okay? Um, is their skin cool, clammy, pale, mottled? What do they look like overall? There's a really important assessment that we teach a lot in flight, um, also in nursing school, is that across the room, we used to say six seconds, I can do it in three. I'm walking across the field, I'm looking at the page, I've already, the scene is safe, I'm lo looking at you, and pretty much in those five seconds, I can tell you exactly what I'm gonna do for the first few interventions, right? Everybody agrees with that? Are they awake, are they not awake? If they're awake, are they alert, or are they sounding up and intermittently awake? What does their skin look like? Are they breathing, are they not breathing? And then I pretty much have my ABCs, right? So cups, have you heard of cups? No. It's kind of like a classification. Is the patient critical, unstable, potentially unstable, or stable? So this kind of breaks it down into, am I going to do a focused assessment? Forget this trauma. Am I going to do a focused assessment or a rapid assessment for life threats? That's why how sick they are, right? Sometimes they never get beyond their life threats. This is your rapid trauma assessment. It's quickly from head to toe, cephalocaudal. What we're going to do is intervene for life threats. This is nothing new. You know this. Um, we're going to locate serious injuries. We're going to control hemorrhage. Um, if, if also going to look at is it obstructive shock? For obstructive shock, is that present? Does the patient have a pneumothorax or a tension pneumo? What do they look like? How am I going to treat them? How are you going to treat a pneumo or tension pneumothorax? Tension, not, not just a pneumo. A simple pneumo is a simple pneumo. Unless it's like greater than 25% of they're compromised. Right. So if they're compromised. We're looking for compromises first, like circulation. Yeah. If there's a shift, we're going to make it. Right. So if you see a shift, I've never seen a shift in the field, thank God, because yeah. usually means they're dead. Right? Pelvis and groin. This is a shattered pelvis. Here, here, here. So these patients bleed into their pelvic region and they can be hypovolemic as well as maybe have a head injury that's neurogenic, right? So there's that mixed shock phenomena again. So if they're pelvic, and we don't rock pelvises anymore, right? We just gently press, okay? Um, pelvic injuries can be devastating. They can kill a patient. So they can lose two liters into their pelvis and groin, and they can do it really, really fast. So if you have a climber or a hyper who's fallen, always think of a potential for a pelvic injury. Or if you have a kid who's not old enough to be in the front seat and isn't in a restraint, because that never happens, right? And the airbag goes off, depending upon their age, they can have a pelvic fracture. 
You want to, um, important to remember in a femur fracture, an adult can lose up to 1.5 liters of blood in their thigh and their tissue. So I, I love indelible men's markers. I always carry them. Everybody laughs at me, I carry them. But I use them for a couple of reasons. If I see a big contusion or, or um, a hematoma, as we call it, a hematoma, a hematoma, I will on the scene outline it, either on the scene or while I'm en route, and I'll put the time. Because trauma surgeons and you guys want to know if that's an expanding hematoma, and it gives them an idea of what's going on. The other thing I like, a black indelible marker, or a red, I love red, but kind of freaks people out. I use a neon red one. At night especially, if I intubate someone, and I know where that tube is, three times the diameter for its depth, right? I'll take my marker at, at the gum, we don't do the teeth anymore, at, or the lips anymore, is I'll mark it in red. So if I think in the dark that that tube may have moved, I can just take my flashlight and quickly look. I don't have to, 21 or 23, because I don't see that well. So that's not gonna happen. So I use my red indelible fluorescent magic marker for that. It's really important to check, and this is also from a legal standpoint, distal circulation sensation and movement prior to and after reduction or remobilization, because that will get you in court. You want to also, we often forget about looking in the back, right? You can have a gunshot wound or some sort of farm accident, um, ranching injury, and not see that unless you roll that patient and see it, and they could have a pneumo and you don't know why, right? Could be a hemo and you want to know that. <coughs> Cardiogenic shock, um, always assess, like I said, for comorbidities. Is it one shock? Is it more than one shock? Did they have a stroke and then they got in an accident? You've heard this before, right? This is nothing new for you guys. Always check hypoglycemia because you don't know if a patient's a diabetic unless they have a pump on or it's a, someone who, a kid or a teenager who's been newly diagnosed with diabetes, type 1 diabetes. District 3. Sorry to interrupt. No, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, all right. So you can have septic shock with cardiogenic shock. We talked about that earlier. So the point here again is to stress that someone's presentation is all not always because of one factor. It can be three or four causes, right? Etiologies. Focus trauma assessment. Yeah, the patient's okay. They're sick. You don't have to perform life threats. The patient's pretty stable. And we'll look through this. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 so you always want to know if the patient's stable or not. If it's a focus problem assessment, they're probably pretty stable. Hey guys, welcome back. Um, their hemorrhage is controlled on the scene. You've done a thorough assessment, primary assessment. Their vital signs are really pretty good. You've done a sample history, you know what sample history is, right? Um, and you want to get them ready for transport. However, you always have to think about is this patient, does this patient from the mechanism of injury have a potential to decline? They still should be transported pretty quickly. And always keep reevaluating them in route. Hemorrhage control, you know about that, right? You know, would you guys have the dust in the powder form or do you have the impregnated gauze? Impregnated gauze. Yeah. Impregnated gauze and then you just use your tourniquets. Yeah. Um, so for kids, little, little kids, I had a baby who had a penetrating injury. Um, which was um, non-accidental trauma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our tourniquets are too big for these little babies. Mm -hmm. So I took like three um, elastic, you know, the tourniquets you use for IVs, and I twisted them together so that they weren't quite as flexible, and then we put it around, used a tumbler, and just, so you have to be a genius in the field. Um, 
tourniquets, you know how to use those. Just secure them, make sure that you mark the time right on the skin that you applied that tourniquet because there's a certain period of time before they have to resurrect or, or um, intervene to prevent that uh, or to stop that bleeding the hemorrhage. That's why I put that here, so important to know. Um, if it's a head injury, you know you have a possibility for increased intracranial pressure. Adults, that's kind of hard to feel, but on kids, they have this anterior fontanelle right here. Usually closes about 10 to 12 months. Every child I see, I'm like, hi, how are you? And they think I'm just like being cute, but I really what I'm doing is feeling their anterior fontanelle. You're not gonna feel it bulge really high unless it's like a VP shunt baby um, who has a shunt in. Um, and the shunt malfunctions, it would be more prominent, but it might be a little bit of a bulge. And you have to fit it with the story if it's something you worry about dehydration, right? So you want to control the bleeding as much as you can with a head injury. How do you do that in the field and control their ICP? Head and bed, yeah. 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 Keep, and this is underrated. Keep the environment as calm, quiet, as you can. So studies have shown that external stimulus can really dry up your ICP. Um, if there's fluid drainage from the ears and the nose, you always think of CSF, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to do this and kind of pollute the nose because that increases their ICP because the, like, or the CSF and the blood can't leak out. Just a little pad right here or you can just hold some gauze. Neck wounds carry a really big problem with free air entering into the venous circulation if it's an open neck wound. We would have, um, where I came from in New Hampshire when I was at Dartmouth, this big logging industry, and we would see open neck wounds and then sucking neck wounds, and they would suck air down into the vasculature, which becomes embolic. Um, so you want to put a dressing over. You never want to make it circumferential. I can't tell you how many times we see people in the heat of the moment just wrap the neck with gauze, and then they come in, and it's not good. Um, <clears throat> clearly. Digital pressure, if you need, try to avoid carotid occlusion if you can. Um, if it's the carotid, they're probably not going to make it in the ambulance and what I mean, if you put the finger in the butt, they're going to bleed out. Gaping wounds, again, is hemorrhage control, um, the large dry sterile dressing. Um, you want to consider a hemostatic agent, a topical one, like you guys have. Crush injuries. What do you guys have a separate protocol for crush injuries at all? No, that's a for life program. No. Okay. All right. No. So that's kind of evolving um, area of treatment now too. Um, typically, what we do is we, if we have to turn it down, we will. We don't use pneumatic devices so much in the field anymore. I think Baltimore Shock Trauma has one that they are, whatever, trialing. Um, and you want to assess their peripheral vasculature. You want to make sure, especially in these kind of crush injuries, they can develop compartment syndrome, compartmental syndrome, and that can be neurologically devastating to that extremity. So if they are cool, pale, they don't have pulses, and they have pain that seems especially out of proportion, they will be writhing in pain with this. Um, then you need to consider that they, and they have poor capillary refill, that they may have compartment syndrome. Always, for any kind of shock, patent airway, adequate oxygenation and ventilation, and restore perfusion are basically our three goals. So adults, when we resuscitate them, um, we want to use um, uh, normal saline or LR or crystalloid. Um, adults get one to two liters. This is just, you know, this is a national average, right? Um, we're thinking about maybe we need to, in hypovolemic shock, kind of intervene a little earlier with something else. And same with septic shock that maybe we need to high, start to refluid resuscitate them and then think about a presser sooner. Pediatric kids, it's 20 ml per kilo times three boluses is the, the national standard. By the time if a kid is septic, um, what I'm doing at Care Flight is saying by the time you hit that se second bolus, if the kid doesn't look good, get your press rate up, get your epi. And we use epi, not more epi, because of that whole idea that the kids increase their cardiac output with, by increasing their heart rate, so epi works better. Infants are five mils per kilo. In cardiac kids, we use five animals per kilo, too. And we reassess after every single bolus. Um, what are you looking for when you give someone fluid and you're hoping it's working? What, what would you see improve? What, kind, what are your clinical indicators? Heart rate down. Yeah, pressure up. 
maybe not as altered if they were before. Maybe what? Not as altered if they were yeah. before. Even better perfusion. Respiratory, Respiratory rate. rate. Tissue perfusion. I mean, sometimes it's the same. I feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good. <laughs> so when we get fluid, we have three categories that we look at. We have rapid responders, transient responders, and no more, no response responders. So the rapid responders, they get the first bolus, they're doing well, we consider giving them a maintenance IV with kids, we consider giving them a D5 half normal along with their bolus. Um, if they're really sick and we have a long transport time, probably not for you guys. Um, and they're doing pretty well, right? They're feeling fluid, they're doing better, they're hemodynamically doing okay. Then we have the transient responders. Those are the guys that you give your first bolus, they, you know. Okay, so we talked about responders. So that just gives you a little idea, because you're thinking, I'm getting this fluid, why isn't it working? Well, there are responders, transient responders, and non-responders. So we talked about assess, re intervention, reassess, intervention, reassess, and that's so important. And you want to prioritize what you're doing. Um, and like we said, life threats have to be dealt with first. So this is interesting. Um, this is adult fluid administration. We always have said large bore IV, 14 or 16 gauge, longest catheter length possible, or you want to drill them. You want to hang big tubing, like if you use a, an extension, there are two sizes for um, IV extensions. The little extension that we put on, unless you, you hook the IV line right into the catheter. There's a little one and a big trauma line. You should be using a trauma one on adults at all times. The repeating one is for kids, for babies. Um, you either hang blood tubing, tubing or trauma tubing. If I'm um, doing a transport and I have blood with me, and it's a person who needs blood, I just hang blood tubing because then I can just run fluid through it, but I could with a pressure bag, but I can also hang blood if I need to. You want to give your normal saline boluses or LR, and your bolus systolic is right around 80, depending upon your protocols, right? Pediatrics is a little different. Now, I get worried when I see a syringe that's probably a 30 cc syringe or a 60 cc syringe. It's a little too much pressure on a little tiny catheter, a 24 gauge IV, and sometimes that's all you can get in. So what we do, the typical caveat is that two attempts for a, a peripheral IV within 90 seconds, if you can't get it, you go to IO. I will tell you, if the kid's really sick, I would just go to IO. I'm not gonna waste time trying to get a peripheral IV. Okay, infants, can you guys do scalp lines? Scalp veins? Yeah. Never done one. Um, remind me to talk to you about scalp veins after. Okay, we'll talk about that. Um, you want to use push pull method, normal saline or LR. There's this whole thing about, you know, do you, if, with normal saline boluses, boluses they can get hyperchromic acidosis. And, do we use normal saline? Do we use LR? Well, we're starting to shift towards LR. Right before I left Yale, our <laughs> transport medical director said, okay, so who knows right now? So what we'll do is you'll do a bolus of saline and a bolus of LR. And we all just stood there like, hey, really? Like, that's kind of all we need now. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to kind of get over that. Mm -hmm. So we went back to saline, but now they're at LR. Unless it's uh, DKA. So ICP, we also have something other than normal saline, 0.9% normal saline, which also brings up another point. When you document, don't just put normal saline, because truly in a court of law, even though you may not carry it, but for agencies that do, you can't prove which normal saline you gave. Did you give 0.9%, which is what we usually use, right, for fluid resuscitation? Or did you give a hypertonic saline that's 3% or 23%, right? So hypertonic saline we use for DKA patients that have had ketoacidosis patients when they start to herniate um, with the theory that it decreases SCP and the mechanism of action for that is pretty interesting. Um, but we can use 3% saline in the field depending upon your protocols for closed head injuries to bring down their ICP. It is a little bit controversial. There are always two sides of the fence. Trauma docs love it. Some of these docs do not. So if it's a general practitioner or internal medicine, they tend not to like it, depending upon who's covering your ED. But the emerging evidence says that it's probably a pretty good 
um, intervention to have. You have to follow your regional protocol. We're going to be adding it, I think, to our protocols here because I'm used to using it. Um, and uh, the data is there to support it. However, there are a couple of new studies that have come out, but the study design is a little concerning for me, and the population of the N that they study is not that great. So if you, you hear people talking about studies, what you have to go is find that study and make sure that it's a good study design and it's multicultural, meaning it crosses um, cultures, different cultures and socioeconomic levels for the most part. We talked about rapid transport, really alleviate any stress response. That's why we talked about keeping a calm environment, touch especially with elderly people, um, mentally handicapped people, and children works really, really well. Airway and breathing, you know why we're doing it. Optimize tissue oxygenation and CO2 removal. You wanna make sure you secure that airway really, really well. Um, if you have a plan A, you better have a plan B for anyone that you're going to intubate. If you go to say, I'm going to do direct, and that doesn't work, what, what would your plan B be, potentially? You can't get them intubated. What are you going to do? Okay, cane. A cane. Yep, do you have LMAs? Uh, not for adults, you have PED LMA. Yeah. You have PED LMAs? I, I would think about getting in adults, too, as well. What do you have for um, video? You don't. You don't. ready for any bleeding or emesis. Um, we have a salad technique that we use. It's a larger catheter. You can suck pretty good chunky monkeys out of there. So that's always good. Days pass, we just make sure you basically cut off the end and then smooth it. Remember that? Uh, advanced airway, that's what I said. Make sure whatever you're going to do, that whatever you're using goes in the right place, okay? Uh, <laughs> um, just BVM, it's eight breaths per minute. You want to look at what your peak valve is set at all the time, right? So we are going to start probably changing our basic peak line for adults from five to eight um, for Dr. Gonda. So um, I'm going to have to read up on that because I honestly haven't seen the data for that, but he is a pulmonologist, so he's really good. So I'm kind of excited. I like change. So you watch for chest rise and fall. Um, respiratory rate 10 to 12 per minute for an adult, but if they're not breathing on their own very well or the respirations are less than eight, you want to bag them. Remember what we talked about with ICP and end tidal CO2? That's something that maybe you know we can look at. Um, tension pneumothorax, um, you're going to decompress them. Is it unilateral or bilateral? Say you put a needle in and you think they have a tension pneumothorax and then you're like, holy crap, I don't think they did. I'm going to take it out. Do you do that? No. no, because then you've created an iatrogenic pneumo, right? I mean, I did it. So it's, you know, if you think there's a pneumo and you need to go ahead and put an angiopath in, do it, because if you don't, you're, you're going to die, right? Mm -hmm. What are your landmarks for putting? Uh, it's uh, going to be neoclavicular musculature. Which space? Yeah, up okay. over the road. Yeah, up over the road. Or we have the midaxillary. Yeah. And Do we have the force to fit just the anterior to the midaxillary line. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. I think technically we have midaxillary in protocol. It's supposed to be put back in because of the vest. Because of the vest. Yeah. I mean, we're waiting on We're right in the or stage of the beginning. Of the yeah, I don't know if we pulled that out to begin with. Yeah, it's just got a little bit of waiting for that. That would be interesting to know. Okay. Keep them warm, keep them warm, keep them warm because they can become much more shocky if you don't keep them warm. Um, they vasoconstrict any 
much more because they're cold and they're shivering. You really don't want someone to shiver because if they shiver, then you're using up more glucose and their basal metabolic rate goes up and then you're just chasing the vicious circle. So keep them warm, warm IV fluid, blankets, thermal blankets. If you have the thermal blankets that are about this big or use the pen packs, the little ones, make sure you don't put them directly on the skin because they can cause burns. Um, especially if you have uh, like a pediatric arrest and you put them on a chem blanket, make sure there's something between them and the, and the blanket, okay? Because we know if people are cold, drugs don't work because they're acidotic and drugs just don't work when you're acidotic. Okay, so we want to think about vasopressors. I don't know if you guys use push dose pressors or not, do you? Right. Um, but if you, you know, for any presser, think ahead. Oh my gosh, who cares if you mix up an empty drip and you waste it? Does anybody really care? No. Especially with kids. Half of your anxiety with kids is like, oh shit, I gotta do this drug dose. And they weigh 8.6 kilos. So that's 0 0.01 times 8 point. Don't do that. They're 10 kilos, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so any drug, and I can actually fax it to you, um, pretty much throughout the pediatric world, um, or I can say throughout the pediatric world, <coughs> all our drugs are based on weight ranges. So I have a graph that we used at Yale that is um, American Heart Approved um, that says for this drug, Epi, this concentration, this is the dose that you're gonna get and this is how much you're gonna draw. Anything you can do to mitigate med errors, you should do, including especially pediatric populations. And we found by using these kinds of devices or if you will, tools, um, also, any app that you use um, has to be company approved. Would you want to do this at CareFlight right now? There was a lawsuit, um, not at CareFlight, nationally, I won't say where, where um, someone in the field calculated out using an app what the drug should be for this kid. And the lawyer in court said, hmm, so tell me, how did you calculate that drug dose? And you're like, oh, with my trusty app, here it is. And then they, the guy said, hmm, because your protocol says you're 0.6 milligrams over that dose. So you're not within your protocol. Now that's coming up and hurt the kid, but you can't prove that in the court of law, so you don't know water. So if you're gonna have an app, everybody should use the same approved app. So obstructive spinal shock, we wanna get crystalloids. Cardiogenic shock, you wanna think about vasopressors like Epi, NorFi. What do you guys carry? Both Levofed and Epi? Just Epi. Just Epi. You're going to want to think about Epi. Now, the thing in cardiogenic shock with Epi is that when you get higher doses or if they're really sick, you increase what we call the MDO2, the oxygen demand on the heart, how much oxygen the patient needs. So it can be a little bit of a precarious slope there. Distributive shock, IV fluids, vasopressors typically. Um, it, I know not in your practice, but in our practice, we use Levofed. There's a study out that says, and I think it's at the thoracic T8 maybe, level, um, if you use Levofed, they have shown in the lab that there's increased spinal blood perfusion, or perfusion to the spinal cord. So, kind of interesting, something to watch. And steroids are, mm, we used to give like a bolus of a brand of steroids right away. And we don't do that so much anymore, so that's the protocol driven by the doc, whatever you want. Has anybody been heard about the CRASH-2 and CRASH-2 studies? So I love research. Can you tell? So um, I wish Raz was here, because he'd probably back me up on that. <laughs> <laughs> so we know with trauma, this is a study that is now closed. It was done in 2002. The study design was really good because it's multi-center and multi-country, right? So it's, it applies to pretty much everybody, right? And this all came out of the um, battlefield and all of the trauma that they've seen, the military has seen. So the end, or the number of people enrolled was 20,000, or just over 20,000, all adults with significant risk of bleeding within eight hours from the time of their injury. So this is a really good number. And here they've defined what time period it's gonna be in. So they're studying the same population, important to do. And their query was, does TXA decrease bleeding and hemorrhage and occlusive events, this is the, uh, 
CRASH-3 study that's come up. And the dose is TXA one gram over 10 minutes, then a gram over eight hours versus placebo. So they randomized them to either TXA placebo or placebo. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we know that TXA works, right? Because what they did is not death in the ED, but you have to define your outcome by morbidity and mortality. So they looked at it within four weeks from the time of injury. There were some problems maybe with vascular occlusion, but we really kind of headed off multi-organ failure and head injury to a certain degree within that time frame, four weeks. So the conclusion is, eh, it doesn't cost much, right? Can't say, so why not? Because there really aren't any adverse events. We know that it decreases the risk of death and bleeding in trauma patients, but probably not after three hours. So TXA, do you guys carry TXA at all? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So CRASH-3 is the second study, which just closed, okay? And it's a randomized trial of giving TXA in significant traumatic brain injury, right? So the question here, again, it's a good study design because it's international, it's multi-center, it's randomized and blinded. And it's 10,000 patients that meet this specific criteria with a total, uh, with a traumatic brain injury. So the query or the question was, is it okay to give TXA and is it safe if the patient just presents with a head injury or a closed head injury? So, and this would be within eight hours of onset and have, this is a score, ICB, um, a CT of a GCS of less than 12, right? So the question, does it decrease mor morbidity? and mortality, morbidity meaning disability. So the exclusion criteria here, meaning people we can't study in this crash three, is anybody who's bleeding outside the brain. Because that just complicates that question, right? We can't figure out really what's going on. The loading dose here is a gram, and then a gram maintenance over eight hours. So the study is closed now, we don't know the outcome, but the hope is that we can give TXA two traumatic brain injuries that have a bleed, and it won't cause a vascular occlusive event or a thrombotic event, because you know when you bleed, we give TXA so the blood doesn't, doesn't what, they don't keep bleeding, right? So it clots. So we just have to make sure, if we're gonna do that, are they gonna throw a clot or have ischemia in their brain? So is the treatment better or worse? So the, the study's closed and the results should be coming out within, I think, the next year.